So here we are. We've been going through the name Muhammad. We're going to continue to do that. But just as Muhammad is a title, and it's a title that refers to, as we know, it, the praised one, the, the anointed one, uh, the altogether lovely, all these different titles that we see about Muhammad as the praised one, because that's the Arabic word. That's, the, that's what it means. There's, this is not the only title. There are other titles that we should not be surprised at that are also in the Quran, also in Arabic. But they also have antecedents. So one of the things that we're going to do today is we're going to look at some of the Jewish antecedents. And, and Mel has brought this over. He's been working on this with A.J. Dios to show you that it, Muhammad is not the only title that we need to that we would be surprised by. And it also not only has Christian antecedents, it also has Jewish antecedents, as we're going to find out, specifically referring to different certain people. But it also there will be other titles that we're going to do in future episodes. But go ahead, Mel. Help us with this. This is something we should not be surprised about. And you're gonna you're gonna look at one word, one name called Salman al Farsi. Where does and who is this Salman al Farsi? Uh, we know about him. He's there. He's referred to. But is he the uh, an Arab Muslim or is he actually a Jewish exilarch? And what does this word exilarch mean? And what are we talking about? Over to you. Yeah. So the a Jewish exilarch is literally the 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 main leader of the Jews worldwide at that time among the diaspora and and, and at home um but the obviously uh, an exilarch can't do everything he needs other leaders in the local areas to run things now the jewish jewish people had various academies all over iraq and the the in at the beginning of the seventh century they introduced a new role which was called a gaon who was the head of those academies and the plural of that is gaonim um, so that was a significant um, uh, leader. Um, most of these leaders in Iraq would have been um, similar to the Pharisees in the Gospels. So they had a similar rabbinical point of view. They believed in the in studying the Torah, but they also they believed in the oral traditions. So that was the Gao name. Um, and there were also judges as well that literally um, had court cases to do with religious and civil matters as well. And as we'll see later, they, they had a, another name, which was Dean or Jen. Um, so they were another significant group. So those three had a lot of the power in Iraq. And obviously, they, they, as we'll see later, they show up in the Quran. But the meaning has been lost. The, the significance of those names isn't clear to the majority of people who read the Quran. So this is going to um, be a real eye opener going forward. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at Jewish links to the Quran. Uh, was Salman al Farsi a Jewish exilarch? So let me just tell you what uh, a Jewish exilarch is. That's essentially the leader of the entire Jewish community uh, worldwide. Um, the most important person. He was a religious leader, a political leader, um, and so the the Jewish people looked to him for for guidance and leadership. So as far as they were concerned. Uh, God's present presence rested wherever he was. He was that significant. The Shekinah was wherever he resided. So the Shekinah is like the holy presence of God. So a very significant person. And he is not in Jerusalem. We're not talking about Jerusalem here. We're not talking about Israel. Where is this exilarch? So he would have in the past have been in Babylon, but then uh, sort of as the centuries went by, eventually they set up in Baghdad which uh, is on the, the river Euphrates. Um, so he is again, you know, way up north, exactly where we found everything pointing to up to now. Um, and uh, it's interesting that there is a person called Salman al-Farsi that is mentioned in the Islamic traditions. But the question that a lot of people have ignored is, is there a historical person that matches up with that name? Um, and are there details about that person's life that have been changed and hidden because it would expose the true origins of Islam? Uh, and yes, there is a person that fits the bill here. And by focusing on him, we actually discovered that the origins of Islam is very different to what we had assumed when we look at the standard Islamic narrative. Um, but the standard Islamic narrative has actually given enough clues away to actually um, prompt us into looking it, into this further 
And when we actually discover who he was and what he did, um, we can make more sense of, of the standard Islamic narrative and why he was trying to hide these details. So with that out of the way, um, I'm just going to mention AJ Juice, who proposes that the Quran hints at debates within, the, within Jewish circles. Judaism was a good deal more splintered and diverse in the seventh century, and the Quran expresses opinions from within these circles. So essentially, unlike the standard Islamic narrative, what AJ Juice and others are saying is the Quran isn't like a revelation from Allah to a man in Mecca, but it's more an expression of grumblings within a, a community um, that is not happy with what's going on in, in their contemporary times. So it's a very different take on the Quran. So our job is to unravel the historical origins of Islam from that of the traditions. So is Salman al-Farsi based on a significant Jewish historical figure? So first of all, let's start with what Islamic tradition says of him. And I've taken this from Islam Online, which probably gives us a fair summary. Okay, notice that he's referred to as the seeker of truth. Um, it says, as a scholar, Salman was noted for his vast knowledge and wisdom. Ali said of him that he was like Luqman the wise and Kab al-Akbar said, Salman is stuffed with knowledge and wisdom like an ocean that does not dry up. Salman had a knowledge of both the Christian scriptures and the Quran, in addition to his earlier knowledge of the Zoroastrian religion. Salman, in fact, translated parts of the Quran into Persian during the lifetime of the prophet he was just the first person to translate the Quran into a foreign language. Now, at that time, um, people weren't um, generally very literate. You know, the majority of the population were illiterate, typically. But to have someone that had this level of knowledge is quite unusual. Um, and so when we look at the historical figure, we discovered that this historical figure fits the bill in terms of having this level of knowledge. Um, I'll just go back to you, Jay, in case you want to comment there. Yeah, I want to ask a very salient question. Are you telling me that we can find a Persian, a Farsi Quran in the seventh century during the prophet's life? Because that would be the earliest Quran in existence. We can't even find an Arabic Quran from the seventh century. <laughs> Are you saying that there yeah. is a Persian Quran that predates the Arabic Quran? No, not at all. This is the, uh, this is the the Islamic uh, traditions angle on this. At least this is what they claim. Um, I'm not vouching for that part of it. Okay, uh, well, the, stop and think what this means. So not only are the Islamic traditions saying that there were five copies of the Quran at the time of Uthman, they're also saying that there's a Farsi Quran that is in existence coexisting with the Arabic Quran of uh, Uthman. So they now have to come up with that Quran as well. We're not just going to... For the five Arabic Qurans, I'd like to know where this Farsi Quran is from Al Farsi. Absolutely. So yeah, that's an angle that I haven't explored, but that that does kind of raise questions. So if they want to make this claim, they're going to need to back it up with actual All evidence. All proving just how hopeless these traditions are. They make claim yeah. after claim. Remember these traditions. So for, just for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about. These traditions that are making these claims are all written in the 9th and 10th century, redacting back to the 7th century. Here's yet another example where they're making a completely false claim of another Quran written by this guy Al-Farsi from the 7th century, and they can't even come up with the five that they claim were written in Arabic. I'd love to see them come up with this one, but proving all the more just how fallacious the Islamic traditions are. Yeah. I suppose the, the thing about it is, is Sometimes there's a, a nub of truth, a core of truth with these traditions, but then there's lie after lie and fabrication um, that completely distorts us so that it's unrecognizable from the original. Um, and I think that's what's going on. And the more they try and patch up the lie, the worse it gets, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, we've all experienced someone who's trying to get themselves out of trouble by lying and lying and lying, and it just gets worse and worse. So, um, with that, I'm going to look at this word Pharisees, which seems like a bit of a diversion. OK, it seems unconnected, but let's ha explore this word because it's, it's key to understanding Salman al-Farsi. So when did the Pharisees begin and end as a group? So you'll find this online. They were founded in 167 BC, dissolved in 73 AD. And to look at that, you would think, well, 
there's no longer anything like Pharisees, but that isn't the way things work. Are the beginning and end dates entirely true? It seems too neat that it just would begin and end just like that. Was there nothing before 170, 167 BC? Such systems take centuries to develop. It's hard to believe that the roots of this didn't originate during the Babylonian exile. And certainly the work on the Talmud, both the Jerusalem and later the Babylonian Talmud would suggest that this group didn't disband, but carried on with some changes. Likewise, the Sadducees did not end with the destruction of the temples. So what you have, despite the fact that officially these two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, are meant to have ended in 73 AD uh, after the destruction of the temple. The reality is they, they dispersed, but they continued doing their work. And the Talmud, for example, the Babylonian Talmud, bears the hallmarks of the Pharisees. It's a very... Um, rabbinical uh, book um, and so I think it's worth bearing that in mind that the Pharisees actually were still there under a different name um, so a slight reformulation of a group doesn't necessarily mean an entirely new group so again I'm saying something about Pharisees but what's this got to do with Salman al-Farsi so we need to explore this word Pharisee okay so we see there that in old English you have Pharisios, Old French is Pharisee, and Late Latin, uh, Pharisaeus, and Greek, Pharisaeus, and so forth. Um, in Aramaic, you have Parishia, uh, which means separated or separatist. And Hebrew, you have Parush or, uh, and Parash, which is he separated. Now, uh, you know, this is totally consistent what we've been told in terms of the meaning of Pharisee it means simply the separated one do you want to come in on any of this Jay? no no this is exciting this is good because I can see now where you're going with this okay so if we look at this example here you can see the the origin going through Prisea um, separated ones okay um, sometimes you have it with P sometimes with PH okay now, if we go to here, what we discover is that the consensus on the etymology isn't unanimous. They're not 100% sure about the exact origin of it. Now, if, if we look towards the bottom half of this and look where number 17 is, we find this interesting detail. Scholar Thomas Walter Manson and Talmud expert Louis Finkelstein uh, suggest that Pharisee derives from the Aramaic words Parsa or Parsa, meaning Persian or Persianizer, based on the demonym Parsi, meaning Persian in the Persian language, and further akin to Parsa and Fars, which is Iran. So, in other words, Pharisee is connected to the idea of being a Persian. Okay, so so you could have. Um, uh, a Jewish person referred to as a Persian. Why would you refer to them as a Persian? Because at one time they were in exile and they formulated their um, doctrines in the land of Persia, essentially. And hence um, being referred to as Pharisees, which is only slightly different from, from um, Pharisees, made perfect sense. It was kind of like a play on the word. And yet, even though it's really obvious when you look at it now, the no one spotted this similarity. Um, do you want to come in on that, Jay? No, there is. I mean, when you even look at the, the the separated one, if these are the separated ones, then of course Persian would make sense, not only where they are locally, geographically, but also that they would be separated from the from uh, from the, the where they came from, from the original part of their. Uh, a, a geographical existence on the top part of that it also fits perfectly with parisa from the aramaic so i can see how all this fits together yeah they would also would have tried to separate themselves from the zoroastrian uh community that surrounded them when they were living there as well so they were um outsiders living in persia at one time so they you know it made sense for them to see themselves as separated ones can i just and, come back uh, on that quickly yeah. Because today, you know, the Zoroastrians today are the Parsis. You, you're aware of that. The current yeah. reference for Zoroastrians, which are not Jews, they are the original Persians, 
their reference and their religion is called Parsi, which is again from the same root. Yeah. So if we see it here, um, we can see Farsi and we can see Pharisee. Now, if you if you look very closely, all there is is basically the I sound that separates them. So it's very close. Um, and I think it's too close to be accidental or, or coincidental. I think um, that it came from the fact that they lived in that area and they took on that name. And uh, we can imagine that the Jews that moved back to Israel would have been referred to as the Persians. It, may, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Or the separated ones. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps Jewish leaders led the Arab rebellion. My solution is that the Jewish leaders cleverly coined this word for themselves as an ingenious pun on the people among whom they lived, the Farsis. That's one possibility of how this um, that's, this name got attached to them. Um, they would be separate from the Farsis, hence be the Pharisees amongst the Farsis. Perhaps in Jewish writings, those labeled Persian may not be, in fact, Persian, but Pharisee. We must be on guard then when we hear that Persians founded the Arab rebellion. It may be the Jewish leaders associated with the Babylonian academies who had a lot of influence among the Persians. So that's the suggestion. So if this coining is correct and the words Persian and Farsi can be used as potential code words for Babylonian Jews, example, the Exilarch, or another group, um, which we haven't mentioned before, the Geonim, and they are the local leaders of the academies which were spread all over um, what would be called Iraq today. So you have the Exilarch, who's the main leader, and then you have the academy leaders who are the Geoni. Okay. So we can now test this hypothesis with an example. What of Salman al-Farsi, Muhammad's right-hand man? Is there anyone in the historical record that could match, or sorry, could provide a match for him? We need someone of significance between 610 and 632, according to the Sins timeline. This timeline admittedly may be off to misdirect us, but it gives us a ballpark around which to work. Now, if you look at this chart, it's quite amazing. We see that the 37th Exilarch is called Shalom, precisely in the period 614 to 640 AD. Uh, I've taken this from a paper written by two Jewish men, uh, Ben Abramson and Joseph Katz. And they actually propose that Salman Farsi is one and the same person as um, Hanamel or Shalom, who is the 37th Exilarch, who reigned from 614 to 640. His brother, Nehemiah II, was the 36th Exilarch, and he was the one that actually conquered Jerusalem um, in 614 AD, so a very significant person. From the Jewish point of view, um, he would have been viewed as a Messiah figure simply because he had won back Jerusalem for the Jews. And then, um, unfortunately, as we'll see, he got killed. So there was a need to continue that messianic um, title with the, the, the following Exilarchs. Um, something else to bear in mind is the Exilarchs are sons of David. Um, they, they can trace their family tree all the way back to David, which is why they're entitled to be an exilarch. So this, this, these are hugely significant people within the Jewish community. Um, it was because Jesus could claim to be uh, from the root of David that he um, could be termed the Messiah. So you can imagine that this uh, search for the Messiah carried on down through the generations. Um, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I mean, we have this whole situation where Jesus himself, both through his mother's line and his father's line, as goes to David, who, if we see in Matthew 1, you see that Joseph, who is not his father, nonetheless, uh, he had nothing, no biological relationship with Joseph. His line goes up to David through, uh, through Solomon. His mother, as we see in, in Luke 3, her father, Heli, also goes up to David through Nathan. So you can see both coming and going on both sides of Jesus' line. So this would be down through Nathan's line, down through Heli, on on down to Hanamel. Uh, in this case, the 37th Exilarch would be from that Davidic line. Hugely significant because just as the Messiah must come from the line of David, 
so th then the exilarch must also come from the line of David. Yeah, so these are like the most significant Jewish leaders in the seventh century that we're looking at here. So the, it's, it's the obvious place to look when we're trying to find the historical figures associated with the beginnings of Islam, because if we think about it, this was the where the tectonic plates of four different cultures met. Um, you had the Byzantines way off in the west, you had the Persians in the east, you had the Jews and you had the Arabs all meeting in this area. So it makes sense that if Islam would emerge out of here, that these religious figures would play a huge part in all of that. They were hugely powerful at that time. Hmm. So if we could, if we look into this a little bit further now, the Babylonian Jewish exilarch Nehemiah bin Huziel, Nehemiah the second, was the thirty-sixth exilarch, and his brother Shalom was the thirty-seventh. Nehemiah was also the Persian governor of Jerusalem. Note that the Persians placed a Jew in such an important position, which goes to show um, um, how influential they were and how you know uh, powerful they were within the community. The Persians and Jews conquered Jerusalem in 614 AD. The remnants of the Hebrew people took in hand their native zeal, wrought very damaging slaughters among the multitude of believers. Going to the Persians, the Jews united with them. At that time, the army of the king of Persia was stationed at Caesarea in Israel. The Jews and the Persians were joined by Benjamin of Tiberias, a man of immense wealth who enlisted and armed additional soldiers. The Tiberian Jews, with those of Nazareth and the mountain cities of Galilee, marched on Jerusalem with the Persian division, commanded by Shar Baraz. Later, they were joined by the Jews of southern Israel and supported by a band of Arabs. The United Forces took Jerusalem by storm in July 614 AD. So this was a massive um, event that happened in the early part of the 7th century. So. What happened afterwards, the Christian rhetoric has the Persians together with the Jews sweeping through Israel, destroying the monasteries which were which abounded in the country and expelling or killing the monks. Bands of Jews from Jerusalem, Tiberias, Galilee, Damascus, and even from Cyprus united on, and undertook an incursion against Tyre, having been invited by the 4,000 Jewish inhabitants of that city to surprise and massacre the Christians on Easter night. The expedition, however, miscarried as the Christians of Tyre learned of the impending danger and seized the 4,000 Tyrian Jews as hostages. The Jewish invaders destroyed the churches around Tyre, an act which the Christians avenged by killing 2,000 of their Jewish prisoners. The besiegers, to save the remaining prisoners, withdrew. So this is actually uh, written by the two Jewish uh, writers that were mentioned earlier from their paper so from the christian side of things um when the jews uh with the persians came into israel they were um massacring people that's the christian side of things from the jewish side of things the christians were equally um cruel to them as well so there's obviously two sides to this story um so what were the repercussions of all of this the roman response was swift to counter the jewish insolence there was the largest ever meeting of Merovingian bishops, the Fifth Council of Paris in Gaul. They decided that all Jews holding military or civil positions must accept baptism together with their families. Massive Jewish persecutions began to occur throughout the Roman Empire. Now you can imagine thousands of Jews um, were being forced to be baptized. This would have created um, a sense of the apocalypse. Um, and so um you can imagine that lots of jews were writing and discussing what all this meant the doctrine uh, Jacobi is actually a document that is written at this time and it refers to um, a jewish person who was baptized became a christian and talking about the events of that time now uh the distrust between the jews and husro reached its lowest point as the jews said that husro had acted treacherously and plotted the assassination of Nehemiah, which happened in 614. There arose great discord between the allies, which ended in the deportation of many Jews to Persia. Shalom, Nehemiah's brother, was sold into slavery until his redemption 10 years later. So this, I would suggest, is very reminiscent of Muhammad's Hijra, 
and maybe this is just a coincidence but there seems to be like a parallel there um, um but there is a kind of provisio here we need to be on guard whether uh shalom really was made a slave it seems like a classic motif similar to joseph being sold into slavery it seems a bit too neat but if this is true it might um, explain that muhammad um, went on a hijra um, and was away for 10 years right so um, let's look at, at the name shalom um, and uh, what it means and let's see how it connects with salman al-farsi okay so shalom means recompense it's related to shalom peace as you can see there um, the name shalom is spelled pronounced the same as the noun shalom meaning recompense it's spelled the same as but pronounced slightly different from the familiar word shalom meaning peace of course islam is said to mean peace as well as as we know um, if we go down further there we can see that there's another version which is shalman okay now if we think about the the name salman that's the arabic equivalent to solomon um, it means safe or secure if we look at uh, solomon then which is a hebrew word a hebrew name um, uh, Solomon obviously was the son of David, and it's derived from the Semitic root uh, SLM, which translates to whole or complete, which is also the basis of the word shalom or peace. So we see there that there is a link between uh, shalom and Salman. Um, there's kind of like a, a way of Arabizing um, the original person shalom to Salman. So attentive. A tentative conclusion is that Shalom's position as exilarch from 614 until 640 does appear to be the origin of Salman al-Farsi, the character that, you know, that is mentioned in the Islamic traditions. Um, particularly as an exilarch, he would be a rabbinical Jew, i.e. a Pharisee, which makes now sense of his name al-Farsi. Hence, we could say that Salman al-Farsi is Shalom the Pharisee. For good measure, as he was located in the Persian Empire, he's simultaneously Al-Farsi, the Persian. Now, um, in addition to all of this, we have some confirmation of this in a Chinese source. Um, this is gathered from a 651 AD envoy report, which was compiled in a Chinese document called Zhu Tang Shu in 945 AD, but it's based on written uh sources from 651 and there's uh, where you can find it and it says the following dashi situates in the west of persia now dashi would be the equivalent of the tayaye which is uh, the tribe in iraq that we've mentioned in earlier videos during the year of daye 605 to 618 ad of the su dynasty there was a persian man herding camels in the mountain of Jufin Modina. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest here is that a potential meaning of this Chinese source is there was a Pharisee leading Arabs, so the Arabs are being coded as camels, in the Kufa Academy. So the, the Jufin refers to Kufa, and the Modina is the, uh, it's like uh, the city. It's referring to the Kufa Academy. Um, so the idea is that he was a leader leading the, not just the Jews, but the, the Arabs as well. Um, and so that's it. That's that's my take on it. Um, this is also AJ Juice's take on uh, Salman al-Farsi. So I'll come back to you. So um, just as kind of to bring it all together. Okay. So what has been suggested here is that there is a chain of Muhammad's and this chain really started when the when Jerusalem was conquered um, and Nehemiah II was the hoped for Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. He was going to free the Jews, allow them to return to Israel and the, the age of the apocalypse was now there and unfortunately he got killed and this Salman al-Farsi who was his brother took over and he kept that hope alive and they gradually uh, built their power. Now you might say, okay, I, I'm not seeing the connection. Um, what evidence is there in the Quran, for example, 
for for this supposition. So well, during this presentation, what I what have I referred to? I've referred to the exilarch, who is the leader of the Jewish community. I'm going to point out in the next episode that actually the exilarch is referred to by his actual title in the Quran. So what I'm going to show uh, in the next episode is that the exilarch himself is referred to by the, t the title of exilarch in the Quran. What I'm going to also show to you is that the Jewish judges are also referred to by their title in the Quran and also the heads of the academies are also referred to and the the Pharisees in general are also in a coded way referred to in the Quran so the significance then of Shalman al-Farsi becomes clear that he was part of a messianic movement in that early part of the seventh century and the people who are writing the Quran are actually referring to these leaders very clearly and we're going to see that in the next episode so that's how it fits in with Muhammad because Muhammad is a messianic figure and what we're seeing from 614 onwards was a messianic um, movement with a chain of different Mahmuds all the way along and that's that's the argument <laughs> Okay, so basically what we're doing in this episode, we're not just looking for the word Muhammad, we're also looking for other coded words, other coded references that are actually quite strongly Jewish coded words and Jewish references. But until you understand where they come from, the antecedents, how they've moved, especially since the diaspora was created in the first century, where these Jews were thrown into, for those who don't know, the Jews were thrown out of, of Israel and they're thrown out to places like way over in the east. Uh, places like Iraq and also Syria, they would have then had these different titles. And these different titles are going to start showing up in the Quran. That shouldn't surprise us. As these titles start to show up in the Quran, you're going to show that in, in future episodes. So the name Muhammad also shows up in the Quran. Uh, but again, it has an antecedent and we need to go back to that antecedent. Great stuff. All right. Now, for those of you uh, if, if you have a comeback on it, just write there in the comments and we'll try to see if we can answer them as best we can. Uh, this is our good friend Mel from Ireland and Jay, 3,000 miles apart. Over and out. <music>